Dear Pat, as we go through the seasons of life, we meet many people. Some of those people stand out more than others. If we're lucky, we meet people who inspire us to reach a little higher and try a little harder. You are one of those people for me. You retired from professional ministry a few years ago and wanted to become a part of a smaller church. When you arrived at Advent, we were introduced by a mutual friend who had worked for you. My first impression was that you were warm and friendly. We connected quickly over our love for dogs and their role in serving others. Before long, you joined our service puppy foster team and we got to know each other a little better. I noticed how patient you were and I also got to experience your sense of humor. You always have a way of lightening the mood by throwing in a joke here and there. That is always appreciated. After looking at our calendars and seeing upcoming travel plans, we decided that we would share a service puppy in training. We refer to ourselves as co-parents. Sharing a dog allows us to travel without concern over who is going to watch the dog. We have bonded over the crazy experiences we have had with some of these silly puppies. We share stories and compare notes about the dogs we're training in an effort to help each dog reach his or her potential. I appreciate your attention to detail when it comes to our puppies. Part of your interest in service dogs came from your years in serving others in the recovery community. Two of your family members faced addiction and went through recovery, and this led to you becoming deeply involved in this ministry and mission. You regularly attend support group meetings. You also meet with people in a one-on-one -on -one setting. It brings you so much joy when your service puppies provide love and encouragement to the people in these settings. As an Air Force veteran, you also have a heart for those who have served in our military. You can appreciate and understand things that veterans have experienced, and you use that rapport to build relationships with them. You listen and offer a safe space for people to share. What a gift. From my perspective, it seems like you see retirement as an even greater opportunity to serve others. You step into tough situations where broken people are facing very difficult challenges. You sit with them, listen to them, and pray for them. In these settings, things are not always pleasant, but you're willing to enter these stressful environments because you believe in the mission. You know that God is able to redeem all things, so you are glad to be present in the messiness. God gives his children with different strengths, abilities, talents, and passions. He expects us to use all of that for the good of his kingdom. And you do this in the way you use your gift for God's glory inspires me to do the same. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we, we ask our, yeah, no problem. We, we ask our team to share letters uh, with folks that inspire them, and it's just been a powerful thing, and just to recognize that we're a congregation full of people that inspire each other to live God's uh, call, and I want to encourage you to do the same, uh, that, that there are people that inspire you, and we don't, we're not always good at talking about it. We're not always good at sharing that, and so I want to encourage you to, to share that with somebody. Write them a letter. Uh, take, a, take a minute just to tell them how much they inspire you. It's a powerful thing to do that and to remember that we're full of a church full of people that inspire each other. This is our series for these next uh, couple weeks as we look at what does it mean to, to live an inspired life? And what does it mean that we have a word of God that is, in, in, we call it the inspired word of God? And how does that, how does that equip us to live this life um, a few weeks ago, we looked at the Old Testament, and we looked at how God was at work and inspiring people and changing lives in the Old Testament. And then last week, we looked at the gospel, the New Testament, the story of Jesus coming to earth and offering new life, offering transformation, offering new wholeness, and the, 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 the opportunity that the gospel provides to start over, to start fresh. And to have a relationship with God, it's an incredible thing. And, and, and this week, we're going to take a look at how this word, how this inspired word, how this gospel story, this gospel hope actually spreads. How that spreads. And we're going to look at that in the book of Acts. Would you uh, pray with me as we open the scripture? God, speak to us today. We, um, 
actually, God, it's just amazing to me that, that you would give your word. You would actually speak to a group of people like us. And that you would write these words and inspire these words to be written so that um, we can sit here in this room and read them together. But, Father, we know this is not just an academic experience. It's, it's um, your inspired word. It's actually your word to us. And so we pray that it goes further than just our heads, to further than just our understanding, but that we would live this out. That we would put it into practice. That we would follow every word that you have for us. We pray all of this in your holy name. Amen. One of the great themes as we uh, talk to people that inspire us is that those people live lives of integrity. That what they say and what they do actually match up. It's not that they just talk about it, but they, they actually live that out in the in the everyday, um, and that's a hard thing to do. That, that's, a, that's not something I'm always great at, um, at living out every day, everything I say that we should be doing, you know. Um, when my oldest, who uh, is 18 now, and, uh, but when he was about eight, about 10 years ago, we, we were going camping, and I am not a good camping guy. I mean, I want to be a good camping guy. I'm just not really, right? And so I don't have all the right gear, and I don't know how to do all the right stuff, but it was just me and him. It was a guy's day. You know, we were going, ho, 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 we're going camping, and we're going to make fire, and we're not going to tell mom about anything that we do on this trip, you know, all that kind of. It was, we were, I was really pumping it up. And we were going to a little campsite pretty close to where we lived in Texas. And on that campsite, on, on those grounds out there, they had this spot where you jump off this cliff called the Devil's Water Hole. And uh, I've told some of you this story before, but I, but I, but the, the, the Devil's Water Hole just sounds manly, doesn't it? I was like, we're jumping off Devil's Water Hole. <laughs> Don't tell mom, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and so we go and we're camping and then we get up early one morning and we trek up to Devil's Water Hole. And, and as we're going, I'm just second guessing the whole thing, you know, like, I'm not sure how smart this really is, but uh, people jump off it all the time. I say, oh, so it's just got to be fine. But on the way up, I kid you not, we're on this little rock ledge, and there was a centipede. I think of centipedes as like little bitty bugs. I swear, it was like that. I mean, probably that, but it was huge. I was like, are we in Jurassic Park? What is this? And, and scared to death and trying to be manly in front of my, that's not a problem, son. Uh, and then we're climbing up the, the little rock uh, walkway, and we look over, and there is a tarantula. It was this big, just going along the trail. And I'm like, ah! Okay, all right, manly stuff, manly stuff. We're not telling mom, you know. And uh, so we get, as we get up to the rock, you know, it didn't look so bad from down below. But once you got up top, mm, it was a little bit higher than I thought it was. And got up there, and I was, man, I'm looking, and I'm, I'm starting to say, I don't know if mom would, you know, want us to do this. And he just laughs. You know, we're not telling mom, <laughs> you know. And uh, okay, so. Uh, I get, I'm like, I'll go first, you know, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get in there, and that way if anything goes wrong, I'll be there to save you or something. Anyhow, I get up to the edge, and I'm looking down, and I would never forget, I just heard, he was a little guy at that time, he just had that little shrill voice. He said, Dad, why is your leg shaking? And uh, <laughs> I looked down, and in fact, my leg was shaking. I hadn't even noticed, you know, <laughs> Uh, I turned. I, I didn't eat enough breakfast. Uh, low blood sugar, you know. I'm, and but uh, but at that point, I had to jump in, right? You can't turn back at that. You can't, you can't just. You have to. All of your dad integrity is on the line at that moment if you don't uh, just jump in. So we jumped in and we had a great time and it was wonderful. And mom found out anyhow, and you know, it was all all great. But I was just thinking about that idea of living out what we talk about. And sometimes that's the hard part right there, that, that moment uh, where it, it comes to reality. How, like, are you going to actually live the way you say you're going to live? And that, that's not always easy. We're good at sometimes talking about this gospel story. We're good about talking about the gospel uh, truth. But, but what does that look like in your daily life and in my daily life and in the life of the church? 
So early on in the story of the church, just a couple pages in, see, we don't have the church until we get to the book of Acts. And then when we get to the book of Acts, that's the start of the church. And just a couple pages in, they face this problem. The gospel message is starting to spread. There's gospel truth is starting to, to expand. And yet, and yet they, they faced a problem internally that they had to deal with. And, and, and the question is like, how are they going to live that out? And, and would they live that out? Would, would there be integrity between what they preached and what they actually did? I want you to turn with me. If you've got your Bible with you, I want you to turn to Acts chapter 6. You, you can use your phone app or follow along on the screen at Acts chapter 6. And we're going to start reading in verse 1. This is what it says, Acts chapter 6, verse 1. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. I'm going to pause right there because it's like, what in the world is that? Well, what's going on? Uh, okay. Imagine right now you're you're uh, you're reading the minutes like a report of some of the things that fell apart. It's like a committee report or something, and you're getting a little update on what's happening in the church. And 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 there was a problem that they had to deal with. Now here's the thing: at that time, everybody that was coming to faith was was Jewish. There were no outsiders. There were no non-Jewish people that were uh, turning to faith. Not at, not at that point. It, it was all Jewish folks. But within the Jewish world, there there were different groups. So there were those who had been in Jerusalem and grown up there and embraced that culture. They spoke Hebrew, and, uh, and they really embraced that. There were others who, uh, because of the way Israel had been taken over many times, had been dispersed across the known world. And they lived out in the Roman, it was a Roman-controlled world in many different provinces and areas, and they often spoke Greek. That's, that's the, that was the, the language of the land at the time. So they spoke Greek, but, and they thought differently. They thought culturally in different ways. Those that held on to the Hebraic kind of culture, they viewed, uh, they viewed the, the, uh, the ones that spoke Greek as sort of wild, out-there thinkers, you know, and, and that they, were, uh, they were pretty much just pagans. You know, they had compromised and they hadn't held true. And so there was tension between these two groups. And that tension comes out in, in many different places places in scripture, but, but what begins to happen now is that uh, there, there are widows, there, there are folks that need food. And in that culture, there, wasn't, there weren't uh, security kind of blankets for people that didn't have anything. So if you were a, a widow, you really needed food and you needed someone else to help you with it. You could not physically take care of it on your own. And so the church came around them. The church said, we're going to take care of those who are uh, of the needy among us. And, and the church was doing a daily distribution of food. They were, they were passing out food every day. All right, that's verse one. You ready? We're going to keep going. You, you with me though? Here we go. Uh, verse two. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of strength and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. And it seems silly, right? He's, he's basically giving us a committee report on some administrative problems and some things that they had to do to take care of. And then he jumps into this wonderful news, this exciting, hey, and the gospel is spreading and people are, people are being saved and lives are being changed. But the two are tied together. And, and, uh, and, and Luke, who, who writes Acts, wants us to know that, that it matters. He didn't just throw in this administrative report for no reason. He, he, he's showing us that, that, that the church has to live with integrity. 
that when we say there's this gospel message and it'll help you live a new way and, and, and treat people around you a new way and have a new set of values that are God's values, you become a citizen of the kingdom, that that actually changes not just how you talk, but how you really live it out. And it's of such importance that he, com- he includes a committee report in the Bible. You know, I, I mean, it's just astounding to me. But I want you to get that he goes, this is so important, it's worth it. He wants us to see that right from the beginning, the church has always, has always stopped and said, if we have difficult problems, we're going to deal with those problems. You know, I, I don't like to deal with difficult problems. I like to kind of skim over the top of them and like not, you know, get around them and sort of ignore them and hope that they'll go away. But, but that's not the history of the church. Right from the beginning, they said, look, this is a, this is a difficulty. This is a problem. It's, it's it, two groups, and it's a big enough problem that's threatening to pull groups apart. And they stopped, and they said, we have tough issues. Let's address them. Let's actually talk about the issues. And then, and then they changed stuff. They changed their whole structure. Now, this church, we're, 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 always, we're okay with change, you know, but there are other churches out there, you may have heard of them, that don't like change very much, right? That's a, uh, that's a typical thing. And, and, uh, and, and I, I mean, I'm really actually astounded because they just, well, they made adjustments. They said, we've got to do ministry a different way. The apostles that are always are taking care of everything, done all the preaching and make sure people were cared for and handled the counseling. And they said, no, we're going to come up with a whole new group that's going to handle that part of the ministry. And they're going to do serve. And they just, they just rearranged it. They adjusted. They made the changes. And I was thinking about that for a, a church. It's of utmost importance, Right? That, that as, a, as a community of faith, if we have this gospel story, that, that this gospel that is changing lives and offering hope, then we have to live that out. But living that out means dealing with difficult things. When we see issues, we have to address those issues. And when we don't see them, we have to uh, build in mechanisms to stop and look around and say, God, what do, what do you need us to address? Where do you need us to make an adjustment? And then, and then as a church, we have to actually make those changes. But it's not just for the church, right? This is a, a biblical principle, not just for the church, it's for us too. And I don't know how you are about making changes, but I'm not very good at them, you know? I've got a phone, char- I got a phone charger that needs to be in the right, it's plugged in, it's in the right spot. It's always right there. But there are like five other people in my house that need phone chargers. And somehow they eat their phone chargers. I don't know what they do with their phone chargers. They, this, they move my phone charger all constantly, constantly moving my phone charger. It's like a game. We're going to hide the phone charger from dad. It needs to be in the same spot. And when I have my keys, I, I put my keys in this. I don't lose keys. I only need one set of keys. I don't lose keys Except there are like four other drivers in my house. And for whatever reason, you know, we didn't move your car down. And they just hide my keys and all kinds of, you know, the keys go in the same spot. My phone charger, I don't do well with change. I want it to be the same. I like that routine. I, I, I don't want that. And the gospel says when there are issues, we actually have to stop and address them, not just ignore them. When there's brokenness, we've got to figure out how to fix it. And then, not just figure it out, not just understand it, not just see it, but actually change our behavior. Like actually make a change. And and this is what the early church does. I mean, right at the beginning, they see it and they make a change. And and the change that they make is actually, it's a pretty big change. And and we might just kind of go, well, yeah, like they're just figuring it out and going on. But actually, it's a big deal. I mean, this is sort of a Bible nerd thing, so you just humor me for a minute. But I just want you to catch what's happening here. It, it, they, they normally, the apostles, they take care of all this ministry, right? And they said, well, wait a minute. You know, we have people in our community that are not being cared for. And if we have people that are not being cared for, but we're called this new gospel way, this inspirational life, then we better fix that. So we've got to change that. We've got to make these adjustments. So, so here's the plan. We're 
going to come up with seven uh, uh, other people. And, and we're looking for people with these. These are the qualifications. They, they're filled with the Spirit and they have wisdom, right? The, the two qualifications, that they're, 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 they're equipped for this. And so we're going to come up with those seven people. And then they're going to do, now what goes on in here and what you read is they're going to serve at the tables. And then the apostles, the apostles are going to um, devote their time to the word and it's sharing the, the word, spreading the word out, this gospel. They're going to devote their time to the word in prayer. And uh, it's just interesting how we read it because when it says they're going to serve at tables, that's a word that's used there, and that word is diaconus, right? And that word means, you've heard this before because it means deacon. You, you, I mean, you've heard that word deacon. Some churches have deacons, even Presbyterian churches sometimes have deacons. And so you've heard of that word deacon. That word just means serve, to serve. Right, So they say, you're going to diaconess the tables. Now, in the translations that most of us read from, like the NIV, when it talks about the apostles and what they're doing, it says they're going to devote themselves to the ministry of the word, and then these guys are going to devote themselves to the serving of the tables. But here's what you don't know on the backside. In the Greek, in the, in the language it was written in, the word's the same. It's diaconess in both places. You're going to diaconess the tables, and we're going to diaconess the word. What, what, was they, what were they saying? They were saying, we are all doing ministry. That word, diaconess, is a serving word. It could also be translated as ministry. You're going to do this part of ministry. We're going to do this part of ministry. They were dividing ministry up according to their gills and their skills and giftingness. They don't have gills. I'm, not, I'm losing my mind today. According to their skills and giftedness, they're dividing ministry up. They're saying, how has God gifted different people with different skills? There it came out, okay. And, uh, and, and how do we employ that in ministry? But all of them were doing ministry. You know what word's not in here? It's not even part of their vocabulary? Pastor. They don't even have that word. It's not there. They don't have it. They, they just have everybody doing diaconus. They're, they're serving. They're, they're doing ministry. And they, they divide it up and, and say, we're going to care for people. We're going to care for people in a holistic way. We're going to make this adjustment. We're going to make this shift so that we can live out this gospel with great integrity. Now, there's, a, there's an important part of all of this. This idea of living out, you know, this integrity, that, that we're going to live out this gospel. You know, sometimes um, people talk to me about being a pastor's kid. I'm a pastor's kid. I'm a third-generation pastor's kid. And what we know about pastor's kids, right, is either they, they go into ministry or they go to prison. Like, those are the two, <laughs> not really, not really. Um, but all, often, that's uh, the joke in the pastor world, but, uh, but, but not all pastor's kids uh, are engaged in their faith as they grow up. And, and sometimes it, uh, they, they run far from it. And so as pastors, sometimes we have these conversations like, what is, how, do you, how do you help your kids um, own their own faith and embrace faith? And that's important to me. I don't have all the answers on that. But I'll tell you one thing I have seen. I, I, I know some, some kids that were, some friends of mine that were pastor's kids that have walked far away from faith. And, and what they saw was their, they saw their, uh, their dad, their parents that were pastors on Sunday morning uh, present a gospel and a faith that they didn't see them live out during the week. And um, I, I've seen that consistently you know, and I got to thinking about that, and I, I was thinking about my own home that I grew up in, and my father, and and um, we, when we would face a problem, you know, it, would, it makes sense, of course, he's going to like, I'll see him praying in church or something like that, but when we face a problem in our home, something that was difficult, he would turn to prayer just quickly. He'd gather us in for prayer, or he'd He'd come sit down on our bedside and, and, and pray, and, 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 and when he prayed, it was like he meant it. And when we saw, you know, as a teenager, you start to really kind of pay attention. As I saw as a teenager, we were facing some difficult problems as a family, and I, I saw him turn to prayer immediately, and I started to think, oh, my, oh man, he really believes that prayer is going to do something, like that this is for real and that this is powerful. And I was able to see just little insights into his care and his passion, but more importantly, his, his relationship with God. 
that was something that was real. It wasn't just a Sunday morning thing. And see, um, if, you, if you want the word to spread like we see in Acts, if you want this kind of inspirational gospel to get out there and change lives, we've got to find ways to actually live that out, not just on Sunday, not just as a pastor, but, but every day. And if you want to bless your family, let them see you. Let them see your faith be real in difficult places and tough places. In parts of your everyday conversations, let them see it. See, Acts tells us that, that that, when you start to see that, that's when things begin to take off. That's when inspiration begins to happen. That's when lives begin to be changed. Now, there's one more thing I want us to, to look at just real quickly. Verse uh, 7 said, so, he tells all about the changes that they made. And then in verse 7, so the word of God spread. And the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. A large number of priests became obedient to the faith. And, now, and then the next thing is he's going to talk about Stephen. Verse 8, now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Sicilia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. And we, we can't read the whole story of Stephen, but I, I want us to to just, just take a look at this real quick. He gives this report of administration kind of changes that have to happen in order for them to live it out at, at, with integrity as a church. And then, he, then we see the word so, the, go, the, the, the word of God, the gospel begins to spread. Uh, but, but what's interesting is the, the word that's translated so, this is my NIV translation. You start to look at other translations, they don't always use the word so. It's a conjunction. They're sometimes a little bit loose. And they'll use the word and. And you go back and look at the Greek, the word is chi. That's the and word, not a so word. It, when, when we write so, we think, all right, well, they made the changes, and that's what caused the gospel to spread. And that's part of it. But I want you to see that it's actually connected to both parts of this. It's a conjunction. It's, a, it's an and. They made the changes and the, the word began to spread. And he's going to tell you the changes mattered. But he's also going to tell you the next three stories matter. And it's actually a, it's both a connection to the changes that they made to live it out. But also a connection to the stories of what God is about to do. They're both part of how this word began to spread. And what you see in the next three stories, the first one is the story of Stephen. And Stephen was actually a martyr. That's going to be the next story. He was martyred for his faith. He held strong to his faith. He was killed for it. And, and not just was he a martyr, but then the whole church was persecuted. And, and they were actually uh, under great persecution. They began to flee Jerusalem. And, and the people of the church, right after this story, had to move to towns all over the known world. It was terrible. It was difficult. But you know what? God used it. That's actually part of how the word was spread, was that, that God used that. One of the towns that they went to was Antioch, which was kind of name dropped a little bit earlier. They were telling you Antioch is coming. Antioch is one of the places where the, the gospel first took root in people outside of the Jewish faith. And the, the gospel started to take root in people that would now go on to the rest of the known world. That, that began to happen not because they thought, oh, we've got this inspirational moment. We've got, oh, such an inspired moment. But because they were under great pressure. So Stephen is martyred and, and uh, people are dispersed. And, and then the next story is the story of Philip. And Philip becomes a missionary, but not because he expected to be or, or, or felt like, hey, that was what he was looking for in his life. But God just said, go over there. And he goes running up. It's a cool story. You should go read that. And he tells someone about the gospel. And then, and then he's sent off to far places. He has just sent. And then the third story is Saul who becomes Paul, right? And so Saul, he's on an anti-missionary story. That's his story. It's anti-mission. He He's against everything, and God grabs him and transforms his life and turns him completely around. But all, all three of these are stories where, they're not, none of them are stories where somebody was like, oh, it's so inspirational. I just feel so inspired by this. I'm just go out and spread the word of God. I'm going to go spread the gospel, the good news. I'm going to change people. It wasn't about inspiration. It was, it was like pressure and difficulty. What I want you to know is that God works there too. 
Like sometimes when I'm, I'm looking for inspiration, I want to live an inspirational life so I can spread this gospel out. I'm looking around for inspiration. I'm like, God, I don't see the inspiration. And he's like, remember when that guy was martyred and that made everybody had to move out and they were, that was inspiration, right? That, that I began to work even through that. And that some of the most inspirational, life transformational work that God is going to do in you and through you happens in the moments when you're under the greatest pressure. You don't see it as inspiration, but God, God is at work. God is changing lives. This is an incredible thing. I want to pray for us. I want to pray that we're a church that always lives the gospel with integrity. And I want to pray that we're a church that, that is used by God. No matter if it's something exciting, like a call to be a missionary, or it's something difficult, like Stephen being martyred, that God would use us. Let's pray. God, would you help us to actually live out this gospel that you've given us? To live out the good news. Not just to talk about it or think about it, but to actually put it into practice. And I pray that all the time, God, but it's so hard. So we pray that you would make us uh, disciples that live sold out to you on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, not just on Sunday. And Father, would you, God, would you use us? No matter what, e even through the difficulties, would you use us? Would you fill us with your spirit, inspire us, so that we may spread your gospel and see lives changed? We pray all of this in your holy name. Amen.